All right, good morning, everyone. We're starting to let people in. It is a, it's now a sunny day on a Saturday morning here in Nashville, October the 16th, 2021. It's amazing how quickly this year has gone by after suffering through 2020, we're almost through with 2021. Uh, I don't know, time is flying, but it's, it's colder outside. I'm wearing a sweater today. Um, and uh, I've already been out to uh, the one Nashville breakfast at with Pastor Fuzz and learned a lot of things from a lot of different people. Our guest today is Diane Lance, who is the department head at the Office of Family Safety here in Nashville. Good morning, Diane. How are you? Good morning. Thanks for having me. Sure thing. So I am uh, usually, as we let people on, I usually start talking about something uh, that's not relevant, but usually it's the background. Uh, I see something interesting in the background. Your background right now is, uh, it looks like a bunch of origami birds. What what are they? They are a bunch of origami birds. So um, I'm right now at the Family Safety Center um, on Murfreesboro Road. And we have some really wonderful artwork in the building, which opened a couple of years ago. And so this is um, origami birds that are sort of like lifting up into flight along the staircase that goes up to the three floors of the building. That's, it's very, very pretty. Who came up with that cool. idea? Is there, is there a, a meaning? Is, I, I know that they're rising up. Is there some <clears throat> meaning or did some, somebody come up with the idea of doing it that way? Well, this is on the staff side of the building. And so one of the things that was really important when we designed the building is that we had really uplifting art, not just for the clients that are experiencing um, great trauma um, in um, you know, whatever form of interpersonal violence they are suffering from, but also the staff that are working with those clients because you take on some of that trauma when you're trying to help someone in trauma. So we want to make sure um, that the art and what you see is equally uplifting on both sides of the building. It's, it's, it's very pretty. It's very nice. Now you have the ability to shift your background, correct? <clears throat> I do. I do. So, um, Nashville, um, we have two family justice centers. We have a court-based family justice center and a community-based, and I'm happy to describe what a family justice center is. Um, but the one that I'm in right now is the community-based center. And this is the largest, let me get a picture. I want largest family justice center in the country. I'm going to take myself out. Nope. Oops. I don't know. I didn't do that nope. earlier. There we go. You have disappeared so, now. Okay. I have disappeared. So this is the living room where victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, um, elder abuse, trafficking, they can come here into this building on Murfreesboro Road and get the help they need from crisis advocates, counselors, um, a lot of nonprofits co-located in this space. And so you can see it's, it's a really beautiful and inviting space. Um, we worked hard to make it feel homey, um, not huge and institutionalized, but you know to send a clear message that your community and your government cares about this problem. It's real. You're important. You're not alone. And um, so this is a lot of what you see when you walk in to our building to get help. These are the type of rooms where you receive the help that you need um, from an advocate or a counselor. And I want to show you a couple of other little interesting things about the building. So you know, this is when you first walk in, this is what we call our welcome wall. And it has the word welcome in almost all the languages spoken in our Davidson County schools. This is an original art piece that um, is now being used in family safety centers, um, numerous ones across the country. And then my favorite space in the building, and I've got to find it, here it is, is our children's play area. And this is this space was designed to just be a place where kids can play big, play hard. A lot of the kids that come into our building are right off the scene. Um, they've been brought in by police with an abused um, parent or caregiver. And so they've experienced a lot of trauma. And so we really wanted this space. You can see the little signs in the background. Yeah. Be safe, seen, soothed and secure. That's what you want for kids that have experienced trauma. Then we have a center in our courthouse. And that looks very similar too. So it's a living room. And so while you wait for court on your domestic violence case, you can wait in a space that is also really nurturing and supportive and get some help of advocates. What a, 
That's really, really interesting. Um, okay, so hold that thought for just a second because I'm gonna come back to you and then I'm gonna go back to my basic question. Um, for those of you just joining, Diane Lance is our guest. She's the department head at the Office of Family Safety. For Nashville, they are a standalone department in Metro government. Um, we have a couple of um, uh, visitors today, special guests, Judge Amanda McClendon is on. Uh, she is a, um, a regular visitor on our program. We're glad that she's here today. And um, Jan Bossing is here. Uh, I don't know if she's gotten on yet or not, but Miss Bossing is somebody I've been friends with for a long, long time. I haven't seen her in a while because I think she's moved out of the city, but she used to work in the DA's office with you. And so uh, welcome um, both uh, Judge McClendon and Jan. We're glad that you're here. Let me come back to the um, to what you, you took us on a tour of these facilities. It's really, really amazing. Who um, who helped design this? And was there, uh, as you were talking through, you, you indicated some strategies, but was there kind of an overall strategy or kind of how did you figure out best practices to design a facility and then ob obviously a facility at the courthouse that tends to um, um, help the individuals that we're trying to assist? A great question. So we really started off with the courthouse um, family justice center called the Gene Crow Advocacy Center. Mm -hmm. And that is a really unique model to have a family justice center in the courthouse. And it solved a lot of our city problems in the area of domestic violence, which is victims waiting in court alongside their offenders. And we did a huge audit in our city of our system, all the way from patrol through disposition in court. And what happens in the courthouse was one of the most problematic areas with offenders or offenders family members intimidating domestic violence victims in the courthouse. So having a safe place was the number one priority. And then having advocates to talk to. So you, you have a victim of domestic violence come to court and then they sit there for hours and get no services. And so um, hiring advocates to really work with them and safety plan and assess their level of risk of being killed and understand the dynamics of domestic violence and refer to resources, that was sort of the foundational aspect. And we had a team of about 30 nonprofits and survivors help us design that courthouse space. And so we really just replicated that model for the community-based center. It was very, very fast to realize, you know, that's great to have one in court, but those victims are already engaged in our system. We need the ones that aren't engaging to um, try to prevent severe abuse and homicides. And so um, this community-based one on Murfreesboro Road, we had over a team of 100 people working on every aspect in the design of that building, as well as the flow of services for clients since we're co-locating so many agencies together. I mean, we have you know, nonprofits here, other city departments are here, such as police, Department of Children's Services is here. So um, it was a big project that took a couple of years to um, get down. We toured um, family justice centers around the country as well and figured out what we liked and what we wanted to do differently. Interesting. So. Um... <clears throat> Um, the question sort of stems from, I took a tour once of Abe's Garden, which is um, on Woodbond Boulevard here in Nashville. And, and what they were trying to develop, they were trying to take the best practices from all, I guess, on probably all over the country and all over the world in terms of designing space that would be helpful to those individuals that they were serving. Those are individuals with Alzheimer's and dementia. Right. Um, so the question is, in terms of designing this, it's the same thing. How did you come up with your model? It sounds like you used, um, you, you looked around the country, but you also talked to survivors as well to try to figure out what would be helpful. Very much so. That is the foundational aspect of everything we do. We have a voices group, which is a group for survivors. And they help guide us today when we make decisions or we do a video or have an outreach pamphlet. They're the only ones that can tell us if we're on the mark or what we need to change. And so every aspect of this building from design to client flow had um, survivors helping us figure out how to do it right. And so what you're describing in that Abe's Garden in some ways is also what in our concept would 
be trauma-informed design where you're, you know, we're dealing with severe trauma victims, including adults and children. And so what are the design elements that help reduce that level of trauma? Because let's say I'm an advocate, I can't help you if your brain is still in a high state of trauma. Um, you probably can't even answer my questions. So what can we do to calm that, well, you know, bring that trauma down a few notches so we can get your order of protection done, get some basic safety planning and get you to come back again, you know, over the course of the next few weeks. Interesting. And things like right. art and lighting all helps that. Well, I noticed how um, everything is um, very, um, um, very well lit up. There's looks like a lot of windows, a lot of light coming in. It's also um, sort of bright and cheery to some extent. I mean, it feels like just looking at it, it felt like you're at home. You're in a much more comfortable situation. You wanted to, that's one of the biggest kind of tricks to try to reduce trauma is make a new space recognizable. So you recognize some aspects like a fireplace and things like that, or table lamps as being homey. Mm -hmm. And so that helps me too, if I'm a victim that I walk in and I see, okay, this sort of feels like a home. Um, when you looked at the JCAC, that space kind of looked, it's a little bit, you know, kind of like what your, what your grandmother's home might look like maybe or something like that. And, you know, you're in a big institutional building. So we wanted that space to feel like a, a tight hug. You know what I mean? That you're really yeah. safe in this big institutional building. This building in and of itself is big. But, you know, it's all designed to show, you know, we think your problem's important. I mean, we have this building here. It's designed to look beautiful and gorgeous. And this is a lot of respect and value we are showing you because your problem matters. And so the two buildings send different messages just in colors and design. It's, uh, it's really beautiful. Um, okay, so let's go back. Let's go all the way back to... Um, Diane Lance, tell us um, the first question I usually ask everybody, but it was so interesting to take a tour. The first question I usually ask all my guests is tell us a little bit about yourself, where are you from, um, and your career leading up to how you became the, the head of this department. Okay. Um, I don't think I've been asked where I've been from in, in a decade. So right, I'm actually you, from, I'm from? New I'm from New Jersey. That's where I grew up. Where, in, where in New Jersey? In Princeton. Princeton, and, New Jersey. Yeah, uh, yeah. Did you um, did you ever walk over to Lawrenceville? My brother went to Lawrenceville. Your brother went to Lawrenceville. It was my still an all boys my, school then. My brother went to Lawrenceville. Did you really? know? Really? Oh, yes. We're going to have to connect and see if they knew each other. Yeah, he never so. made it all the way through, but. Okay. He, he well, my brother was a day. <laughs> my brother was a day student. That's a, okay. so Lawrenceville back then was an all boy boarding school with some day local day mm -hmm. students, and he was a yeah. local day student. So I grew up there. I went to Vanderbilt undergraduate, um, met my husband, um, my undergrad and undergraduate. And then we moved out to San Diego, um, California, just because it sounded like a cool place to be um, without, without jobs. And he became a um, teaching pro for tennis um, at some clubs out there. And I I sort of found my job through the yellow pages and I looked up youth uh, and found a job at a home um, where kids, um, juveniles um, in the court system were sent to live there for a month or two um, because of, um, you know, to try to, you know, not put them in the juvenile, full juvenile system, have this sort of halfway place where they get counseling. And I was their counselor and I know I, I had no experience to be a counselor, but that, that's what I was. <laughs> And so I did that for a little bit. And then I went on to, um, they, they wanted to move me to run their domestic violence shelter. And, and I didn't know what domestic violence was. I didn't, I didn't grow up in a household where there was, you know, abuse of any kind. And so that was an interesting, I, I was so surprised that, that that happened. And so I ran that shelter and it, it was a pretty bottom of the barrel shelter. It, you know, I had, you know, rat fall out of the light fixture and onto my desk and, um, it was on the worst corner of San Diego, so there was a ton of gang activity surrounding this house. But that was my, my really first involvement in the subject. And then um, my husband got into business school back in Nashville, so we moved back here. And I finished law, I'd gone to law school, finished law school at Vanderbilt, 
and then went on to work for Tori Johnson as an assistant district attorney in his newly created domestic violence division. This is around the time of OJ Simpson, so there was a lot of focus on domestic violence. And then I went on to run the child abuse division, which is child sex abuse and child homicides, and became exceptionally paranoid during my pregnancy um, about my own children. I had a rash of daycare cases when I was pregnant um, that I had to prosecute. And so I stayed home with my children for about nine years after my first one was born, did some real estate stuff, um, investment properties, and then went back to work for Mayor Carl Dean. And, um, you know, an interesting thing about a mayor's office is when there's someone in there with a special interest, um, those in the community that have a concern will go to that person. And so a lot of people were coming forward in the domestic violence community with real and legitimate and strong concerns about how, how, how things had deteriorated in our system in serving victims since the 1990s. And, you know, this is um, about 2000, you know, 11. And so things had really gone downhill. And so I had the privilege of being able to do that work, which has rolled over time into our city creating one of the only departments focused on interpersonal violence. There is so much Nashville should be proud of. And I just don't think everyone knows that in creating this type of department in these two family safety centers is, is something Nashville should be enormously proud of. So, um, so tell me leading up to the creation working in the DA's office, um, working in the DA's office and then working for Mayor Dean. Um, the number of cases, um, have we seen um, an increase in the number of domestic abuse cases? Um, what, do, what are you seeing from the standpoint of numbers of cases? And then I'm gonna get to the Office of Family Safety and types of cases, what you, what you do actually at the office? So um, I would say the number of cases that are domestic violence generally is takes up, and it's very consistent, about 47% of all crimes against a person are domestic violence. I mean, that changes a percentage point or two, but it's always hovers right around 50%. So if, if, if we as a city really want to have an impact on violent crime in our city, domestic violence is the biggest chunk of that pie, like of this, of a, the type of crime. And so um, that is pretty consistent. Our domestic violence homicides do fluctuate. Um, and the one year that I always find particularly interesting, you know, I mean, we've ranged since 2010 to 2020 between um, seven to 15 homicide, domestic violence homicides per year. But 2014, we had four. And I would love to say that's because we opened up the Jane Crow Advocacy Center and all of these great things were happening in our city. And I, I do think that certainly played a part, but that was right around the time of Ray Rice, um, that, that, that video that went out, you know, where he, he really knocked his, his wife out in the elevator. And when there's that type of public attention on the issue, victims get help. Um, and um, that, that discussion, I really think, drove down the numbers for that year. So we really keep every year trying to put a lot of emphasis on outreach and getting the message out. I mean, like, like right now with um, Gabby Petito, um, it came out that it was a strangulation. Those of us in this field, um, we knew it was a strangulation from point one. Um, but now, now um, you know, we all hope that victims that are being strangled know how very dangerous the person, um, the man that they're living with is, um, because stranglers are killers. So, okay, so the numbers seem to be, at least in terms of the percentage, seems to be about the same. Uh, you had the, the weird number in 2015 where it was much lower. Um, obviously, we don't want any of this to happen. The whole goal is to prevent any type of domestic violence. Okay, so tell me about the Office of Family Safety. What, what is the role of the, of the department? What does it do? So Metro's Office of Family Safety, again, like you said, is a department, just like Parks is a department, the police is a department, so is the Office of Family Safety. And our mission really is a few things. One, we oversee the two family justice centers, the Jean Crow Absey Center and the Family Safety Center, where I am. And the other things that we do is we have most of our work is focused on improving victim safety and offender accountability. 
because those two things go hand in hand. You can't do one with, you need one. You need to do both. You need to come at both ends of that pipe. And the other thing that's just a very important role is that we work to keep the collaborative together. There are so many nonprofits that work in domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, child abuse, and elder abuse, which is all under the umbrella of the work that these centers do and trying to keep, keep those conversations and partnerships together so victims don't fall between the cracks of these agencies and government. So I see um, Kathy Gurley is here and she is the, the um, CEO of You Have the Power, you know, which has been around for a long time. They are a close partner with our agency. And so Kathy might come to me and say, you know, I've met with a victim and they say that this happened in their order of protection process. We think it's a big problem. So they have a quick connection to government to try to explore that problem in our order of protection process and hopefully fix it. And then we, in our close relationship with them, know to go to them maybe for their trafficking video and training. So that is, that is part of our job too. Okay. So how do... Um... So let's just go through the basics of how somebody gets into, finds their way into your program. What, what do you all do? Do you all go looking, you know, as people come through the system, are you looking for people or people looking for you? How does all that work or is it a combination of the two? It's a great question and it's a combination of the two. So at our course court-based center, the Gene Crowapsy Center, it's just whoever has court that day on a domestic violence case or who is referred by a judge. Um, at the center where I am right now, the Family Safety Center, that is a, you do not need an appointment to come in and talk with an advocate. So we are open 24 seven to help you with what you might need. So after hours and weekends is pretty much solidly order of protection assistance. To meet with an advocate about other things and order of protections, it's basic business hours. So advocates are there, you can just walk in the door, um, and we, our advocates will sit there and do a safety plan with you. See if you want to get an order of protection, you will leave with your ex parte order of protection from our center. We do a danger assessment to assess the level of risk, the likelihood that your offender might try to kill you or seriously injure you. And that is an evidence-based tool that's used nationally. We talk about power and control, like what are the dynamics? Sometimes when you're in the middle of something, it's hard to see the big picture of the type of power and control your offender is exerting over you. And then we also, we look at who are the highest risk victims. This is a large part of our work. Who are the victims that are being strangled? Who are the victims that their, their offender has threatened them with a firearm? Um, or has access to a firearm. Um, those are, I mean, two high key, high risk indicators or leaving your offender. How can you leave your offender safely? That's a high risk time too. So take those high risk cases and review them with our community partners to wrap around services and try to help. We flag um, every case. We look at every order of protection and every criminal case in general sessions to see if that offender has a history of owning or using a firearm. And also if that offender is a strangler. And then we make sure the community partners, police and the district attorneys know who the stranglers and those um, that are domestic violence offenders who possess or have access to a firearm. So they know that those high risk indicators as well. Right. So obviously that's a lot of work involved in that. Yes. Um, let me, um, well, let's, uh, let's go the court route first. Um, so uh, an individual and I would, um, uh, individual is the victim of domestic violence and is uh, uh, lots of issues all surrounding that. They somehow end up in this system because somebody I would guess is, um, either somebody has been charged with domestic violence or somebody seeking order protection or something. Somehow they get into the court system. How are you, how does your, it sounds like you flag all the cases that are coming through, but yes. how, how do people, how do people all of a sudden feel like that they've got somebody that is there to kind of help them? So if you are going to court on a criminal case, you have contact with your district attorney's office and they will instruct you to go to the Gene Crow AFC Center instead of the courtroom. And so that's how we get you into the courtroom. And then when you show up there, the DAs actually work out of our center. So they do their, their 
their meetings with you as a victim of a domestic violence crime in our center instead of up in the chaos of the courtroom. And then after they are done talking to you, our advocates come in. Everything is completely confidential when you talk to our advocates because we're a separate agency. And then they do all that other type of work to help plan for your safety um, after the meeting with the district attorney. And then we walk you up to court when it's your time to go to court, sit with you in court when it's your time to be in court. It's a little different with COVID what we do, but that's the general way we did things before some of the special procedures are in place. And if you need an order of protection while you're waiting for court, we will help with the order of protection as well. Okay. So that's how it works in our court center. Okay, so uh, stay with the court for a minute. Obviously, um, for individuals <laughs> that are going through this, it can be very intimidating. Yeah. Um, and the fact that you're, um, you've got a system set up, you're not in the chaos of the courtroom, um, you're in the advocacy center, you're talking, there are people who are coming in saying, okay, here's you know, here's what you're going to see, here's what you're going to experience. And then obviously COVID, whatever, there, there are efforts being made to sit with uh, the, the victim so that they, they have somebody with them. That's, I can imagine that's very difficult on the victim. So um, how, does, how does that work? How, particularly um, both during the proceedings in the court and then when they leave, how, how do you help them kind of get through this? Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch to my background to the court center while we talk about court. It's so magic. Yeah, you is, keep moving around. That's great. Right. So okay. this is where you are when you wait for okay. court. So um, you've been able to sit here for a few hours and back behind me, there would be or in front of me in this version. There's a, you know, we have breakfast food and lunch food, um, coffee. Um, so you've been well taken care of in here. You've met with an advocate and now it's time for you to go up to the courtroom. And as I said, we escort you up there and we sit with you pre-COVID um, limitations. And that's important because offenders, you know, in the past before this center existed, would sit next to the victims in court, intimidate them by text or by look or just saying something next to them. And it made it very hard by the time the victim was called to talk to the DA or to testify to do so um, with your offender having intimidated you potentially throughout the day in court or their family members cutting you off in the bathroom, saying something as you walk by um, their gang affiliates. I mean, that happens as well. So being in the separate location really has been an enormous game changer. Um, for victims and what they experience in court. And oftentimes court is passed to other days. You don't get it resolved on day one that it's set. So why would I ever come back to court if I have had a horrific experience and I have been scared and I've had to keep my eye open for my offender for hours? That is the most anxious thing you can even imagine. I have it, I don't have it on here, I would pull it up, but I took a picture before this center was built of how crowded the courtroom was and everyone was funneling into the courtroom. And it's so interesting when you zoom in to key women in that picture, every one of the women is looking. I mean, they are, you can tell they are looking like, where is, where is he? And, it, and there, I saw one man who looked scared in, in that picture as well. But the rest of people are, they're just trying to get in the courtroom. They're not, they, they don't need to look and see where, where the person they're afraid of is. And, and so imagine sitting in that all day. So here you're separate and you're safe and you get services and help for the order of protection hearing and the general sessions criminal case. Okay, so tell me, um, uh, after the court proceedings, people are going home, what, what do you, what can you all provide to people who are leaving the courtroom? What do you, what do you do to, to help people get through that? Well, when they're leaving court, we, we always ask if you, again, this is a little bit pre-COVID, but if you need an escort to your car <clears throat> and security can escort you to the car, and that would be from the sheriff's office, um, because some offenders might try to meet up with them at their car. Um, in the parking garage. So that is sort of a key safety thing. Secondly, we do a ton of follow-up. So we follow up with clients um, by phone and check on them and see how they're doing, especially the high-risk clients, because the needs aren't just going to be that simple of getting a safety plan. You're changing your life and how you do things. Um, so 
Um, so doing, you know, and, and the safety plan includes, you know, not just how can Diane be safe leaving my offender, but what if I'm not leaving my offender? Our safety plan includes how to be safe if you're staying there, if you're staying with your offender. That can be, you know, if an abusive incident happens, don't run into the kitchen where the knives are. Don't run into the bathroom where they're all hard objects. Be in a room where if you hit the ground, your head isn't going to hit something and cause tremendous injury. Separate yourself from your children. Um, roll up in a ball in the corner so some blows hit the walls and not you. And always we tell them about strangulation and the high risk of that or being threatened with a firearm. So... Well, that's uh, pretty uh, obviously um, difficult stuff to have to hear, but obviously important to learn. And uh, my guess would be if they they are continually running into a, another situation, they are given an advocate's name to call or to quickly get in touch, or obviously they call the police if they really need to do that. And, you know, in our building connected kind of underground are our partner detectives. So from domestic violence, youth services, sex crimes, it's all under the, the chief's new interpersonal violence branch, which is, it's just an amazing thing that he has put together. And so if you've come to our building and you wanna speak with a detective, you can still do that right here in this building um, as well as our nonprofit partners. So. So a lot of people will, will have a connection to an individual detective in addition to their advocate. Okay, all right. So where you are now in this, not in the court, courtroom, courthouse, you're now in the, the other building, the Office of Family Safety. Um, so do people, how do people find you there? Uh, is this a combination of people who you've also, you met through the court system, and they're coming in and they're talking if they need assistance, help. But also, it sounds like you all are open 24-7. If people hear about you and they're having a problem, they can come in. Yes, yes. So um, one thing to know is everyone can always call the hotline. So the YWCA hotline is 24-7 as well, and they know about our services. Someone, police bring people to this building on Murfreesboro Road, 610 Murfreesboro Road, um, right off of the scene to get their order of protection and for other areas of help. So again, Monday through Friday around nine to six, you will get the core services with our department advocates. Um, so you can come in to meet with a detective, you can come in just to safety plan, you can come in to say, I don't, this is sort of going on and I don't, I don't know what to make of it. It's, it's confusing, is it abuse? Um, so those are all the things that we can do. After hours in the weekends is purely order of protection assistance, which is offered by our nonprofit partner, Agape Morningstar. And so their advocates, which um, um, will help with those things during that time. So yes, that is just come on in on your own um, and ask to speak with an advocate if you're a victim of domestic violence, trafficking, sexual assault or elder abuse. Um, and certainly um, there's a large child abuse component in this building that um, our nonprofit partners work with. Okay, so talk about, um, that's probably a, a good lead into, okay, so we've been talking mainly about domestic violence, but uh, child abuse, elder abuse, how does that work within the framework of what you all do? So that is under the umbrella of interpersonal violence. <clears throat> it's also under the umbrella of how the state defines domestic violence. So, um, so, but under the umbrella of interpersonal violence that is within the mission of our department um, to work within all, all of those areas. So this Family Safety Center um, located full-time in this building is the Nashville Children's Alliance, which is a nonprofit that works with um, sexually um, abused, severely abused children. They do the forensic interviews of those children. Those a forensic interview is, is an interview of a child um, in a way that can be used in court. So it answers the questions the police need, the district attorneys need, and the Department of Children's Services. So that child doesn't have to go to three different people to answer the questions that they need answered. You can do it all in one interview. So that's done here in this building and they also offer free counseling um, for children. And 
so that's a big chunk of, of this building. And then the Department of Children's Services is their partners that they work together for the safety of children, as well as the Youth Services Division, the police department. So now you've co-located the child team in that way. So elder abuse victims can come in um, and work with us in our building. 54 works out of this building a certain number of times per week. And then the district attorneys runs their VAPIT team, which is a vulnerable adult protective investigative team out of this building to go over, you know, severe cases of vulnerable adult and elder adult abuse. Okay, so if, um, <clears throat> obviously if, if someone suspects um, um, some type of uh, child abuse or elder abuse, uh, those two areas, and they don't know where to turn. They can do they do they come to your office? Can they come into your office and go? Uh, we need to report this, and we're we're lost, and we need help. Well, certainly, if they want help reporting, they can. But those child abuse hotlines and elder abuse hotlines would be the first course of action. They will help guide in that process. If um, so, that would be what we would do. If you come, right. in, we would just pick up the phone with you and call. And those calls can be made anonymously. So. Um, you know, that that's just such an important thing to do if you suspect um, a child or an elderly or vulnerable adult are being abused. Okay, and, but in the, the different offices that you're talking about, Agape, uh, you've got the Nashville Children's Alliance. Are they, are they, um, do they have separate offices within your building or are they really part of your office? How does all that kind of work together? Yeah, that's a great question. So here in you know, this large family safety center, it's a mixture. So the Nashville Children's Alliance by statute has to be separate. So they have their own entrance and parts of their, where they see their clients, the rest of us can't have access to without them walking us into that space. That is a, okay. a statutory requirement. So our other nonprofits work amongst us. So we, you know, they work in our drop-in partner spaces, legal aid is here. They have their own office, Department of Children's Services has a whole portion of the building within us. Um, so it's just sort of, you know, whether you're a drop-in partner or a full-time partner, what your space looks like. Okay. But, but let's somehow... say Kathy Gurley wanted to meet with a client here. So Kat, Kathy can come um, work out of a drop-in space and use some of our client, client rooms to talk to and work with a client. Okay. Um, okay, I've got a, a couple of other individual questions, but um, again, it sounds like the, a lot of the key to this is the coordination of all these different groups, making sure that um, people get to the places they need and they get the services that they need. And do you all have case managers or case workers that are kind of responsible for coordinating all these different activities? So we have the advocates that do the direct client work and that's really crisis intervention. Then we have folks that do more macro level work, those task forces and teams that maybe review every high risk victim and decide, work together as a community team on how we can help protect um, the needs of this, help, help this victim you know, get to safety and hold that offender accountable. Um, in between that, um, well, there are also therapists in the building with the police department, but there's this gap between crisis advocacy and therapy and that would be case management. And I think that's really what you're describing. The person that sees that client, oh, you know, multiple times to help get lots of needs being met. And so that is something that um, we will be utilizing some American Recovery Act funds is to um, have case managers in our department to fill that gap between the crisis and therapy. Right now, therapy wait lists um, for victims of interpersonal violence are, are so high. And so we also will be distributing some of those American Recovery Act funds to reduce or eliminate those wait lists, which can be you know, between one month all the way up to nine months to wait to get into therapy for um, the abuse you you are going through that's just too long um okay question just came in about lgbtq individuals um services for individuals coming in i, I, I would guess particularly if it's um 
domestic violence or or all ki any kind of violence dealing with family same type of services anything different oh, absolutely well okay. absolutely um unless there is a special particular need um in that situation that that you want your advocate to advise on but but yes absolutely i mean you may um have noticed, let me find it again, um, our, our welcome wall, you know, we made sure we did one welcome in the colors of the rainbow. So you know that, you know, right when you come in um, that, that you are welcome. We um, just, the, the, the intimate partner violence um, is, is not a heterosexual issue. So it happens yeah. in all relationships and family situations. So so um, I do realize that being called the Family Safety Center, um, you know, we really struggle with that um, over the word family because, you know, you may not feel like you're a family when it's your dating partner um, and, and, and there isn't, you know, that, long, that longer term commitment yet. And so that was a concern with the name, but it doesn't seem to have caused a problem, but it does, we do need more direct outreach um, into the LBGTQ community as well as other um, underserved populations. So we've been really trying to track, you know, where most of our homicides, what part of Nashville they're coming from, where most of the, um, the highest um, level of violence in domestic violence cases, like geographically, where is that in Nashville and how does that compare to the number that we are actually serving from there? And that, that guides us on where we need to improve our outreach. So our outreach has quite a few areas to improve. This building's only been here for three years. We were on the, well, sort of, yeah, we were on the one year anniversary um, in March of 2020. So people don't know about it yet as much as we would like. All right. I'm gonna to get to that in just a second, but we did have a question. Uh, Alma uh, Sanford wanted the, the hotline for uh, the, the YWCA, the domestic uh, abuse hotline, domestic violence hotline, and the elder abuse hotline. I don't, do you have that in front of you? I know we can get it for people, but I don't you're looking at something, so I thought you might have it in front of you. I don't, and I should have written that down and I apologize, okay. but I do wanna say hello to Alma. I know she cares a lot about these issues. Okay, so let me ask you a follow-up question to what she was asking for, and then we'll, we'll try to make sure we send it out to everybody. Um, the duty to report. So obviously I spent a lot of time on um, elder abuse. There is a mandatory duty in this state to report any type of elder abuse. Yes. Child abuse, domestic violence, what are the state laws regarding the reporting of that? Child abuse is mandatory reporting, domestic violence it is not. So, um, you know, we do with every client we go over, you know, your visit here is confidential. Um, you can release us, you know, if you want to talk to a detective, you sign a release that we can share information with a detective, but there is always the exception, um, you know, um, there are always those state mandated exceptions regarding child abuse and elder abuse or intent to flip harm, you know, serious harm on another person, I'm not getting the language exactly right, but there are some exceptions to confidentiality that we review with each client. Okay. All right. Okay. So a, a series of different questions. I think um, we're putting the, uh, there's the crisis and support uh, helpline for the YWCA. And we should be able to get the elder abuse hotline. Yeah, up in just I a do second. want to do a shout out to the YWCA. They just opened up a pet shelter. Um, with their shelter. And I just think that is a phenomenal thing that you do not have to make a decision between your safety, the safety and love you have for your pet. You can all go into shelter. Pretty amazing place. Yeah. I think we were both out there at the same time. I think we were, were you out there for the, the ribbon cutting? I can't remember who no, was there. No, I wasn't. I, oh, okay. I, I was there and it, it was really hot that day. But um, <laughs> But I will I, credit to them because that's a very, very smart thing to do. But that was very smart. And I'm glad it's been done. Um, Sharon okay. Roberson got a long time dream done with that. So that was, it was be very, very proud very as a city. Okay, a couple of questions. Uh, Jean Crow, um, tell people who don't know who Jean Crow was. Most people on here probably do remember Jean. But. So Jean Crow is an attorney. Um, basically a career attorney um, from the history that I worked with her at Legal Aid Society. And we consider her to be the mother of, mother of our domestic violence movement here in Nashville. 
And she um, worked her whole career at Legal Aid in the field of domestic violence and helping victims on the civil side of their needs, which would include orders of protection, divorce, child custody, landlords, um, you know, kicking you out of your apartment because the police come too much, things like that. Um, she was just such a, a dedicated um, um, woman to this issue. I mean, I, someone recently told me a story and I can't remember what country she was, but she had a girls group that she liked to travel with and she picked the place, some place they were gonna go and little did they know she really wanted to go there to serve papers on the offender. So um, she's just <laughs> drug her whole group to her vacation there to get that done. So she just never, never stopped. Um, trying and caring. And she was actually, um, along with Judge Smith, Jean Crow and Judge Smith went to Carl Dean when he was mayor and were the ones that really sat down and said, everything is deteriorated. It is horrible for victims of domestic violence. Um, we have gaping gaps in our system and this needs to be um, handled. And that's when that became my job from within his office. So um, Judge Smith and Jean Crow really put that into motion and I'm so thankful for it. All right. Thank you for uh, for explaining all that. Um, okay, um, two more probably big big questions for you. Um, order of protections. Okay, yes. so you've talked about people being able to get them in different ways. Um, tell people about orders of protection and explain their benefits, and um, then let's talk about how maybe how they could be even more powerful, okay? Okay, so an order of protection, some might casually call it like a restraining order. It is an order of protection here in our county. And that is a document that orders your offender to stay away from you. And it is a really important doc document to have um, because it makes that offender immediately arrestable if they are near you. So sometimes people don't know that and they go to court on the criminal case and the judge says, okay, a condition of your bond is that you stay away from, from, from you know, your, this intimate partner. And one, that's not immediately arrestable. The DA would have to file a motion to revoke the bond. It'd have to be set in court. Um, and then it would have to be heard in court. So that's a long time between when they come around you and when that offender can be held accountable. Unlike an order of protection, it's immediately arrestable. Violating a bond, um, you know, you can just get your bond, you know, increased or you can get a contempt of court. But um, a violation of order of protection has actual real criminal penalties to it. And so it is a very important document, not only to get, um, but to keep with you, keep um, in your car, in your home, in your purse copies, and um, where your children are in school, um, especially if your children are covered under the order of protection. It can also grant you um, for that period of time of the order of protection to be able to stay in the home, um, which is really important. Um, so you don't feel like you've been put out on the street. But um, so all of these things are really important. But most important is it People will say it, it, it's just a piece of paper. And if you really feel like your offender is going to kill you, if you have been strangled or have been threatened um, or in any way with a firearm or he has really easy access to a firearm, you probably do need to get in the shelter to um, really figure out a true safety plan because you know it is a piece of paper and your offender would be immediately arrestable. But but you need to make sure that that your offender cannot kill you in the meantime. And so that's that's important. So that time to see if they're actually going to abide by by that order is important to know. So I would guess that that um, individuals that are in that situation are that's discussed and strongly encouraged to seek proper shelter for protected purposes. For those high risk victims, which right. again, we assess through that danger assessment. Police assesses at the scene. This is actually something really interesting we didn't talk about. I'll be fast about it. But the police a few years ago implemented the lethality assessment protocol, where they ask a series, I think it's of 11 questions at the scene with you to assess your level of risk of being seriously injured or killed by your offender. And they did last year 7,220 of those lethality assessments. 17%, okay, so if you come back as high risk, 
they can connect you immediately onto the YWCA hotline. Um, so you get crisis intervention at the scene with, if you are a high risk victim. And so 17% of those LAPs, there was a shelter intake with the YWCA. All right. So that's and a then, great improvement. And the, um, is there always, is there always a place for those individuals? So the YWCA and our other shelters, such as Agape, um, they will prioritize um, those LAP calls, those lethality assessment calls where the victim has come back as high risk. So um, Agape increased their number of beds. The um, YWCA has made some adjustments as well um, to try to make sure the highest risk victims um, will have a place in shelter. And that's been just a wonderful partnership. Okay. Can we you know, use more shelter beds in our city? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Well, I always wondered, I think I mentioned this on this program before and I threw it out to a judge years ago, but is there a way, I mean, I understand the importance of orders of protection, but also understand that there's a safety risk. Um, and the question always was, if, it's, if the, the situation is that drastic and maybe in more cases than, the 17%, it may be, the idea of somehow creating a system, you know, through the use of uh, electronics and technology so that both parties have to wear something, some type of electronic band so that if the person gets within a certain distance, you know, whether it's five or six miles or whatever, the, the victim um, that is being protected automatically is warned that there's a problem. Um, or that somebody has gotten within a certain distance and they they can seek shelter if they need to do that. I don't know if there's ever a system that's been created like that. I know it's expensive, but and I know people yes. can try to take off the bands, but it, it is like expensive. I think it's underutilized. I think things like that can be used um, with orders of protection in conjunction with it. Um, there's a whole area that I think. Um, and you know, I've heard Judge Smith talk about um, this sometimes is, you know, when you do an order of protection, you can also order that they go to a batter's intervention program. You can order that type of electronic monitoring. And so there are some tools that we yeah. can utilize in conjunction with the order of protection. Okay. Just always interested in that. I'm, I'm always trying to think of some ways to make people safer. All right, last, uh, I think this is your last question. Um, outreach. How do people find out about you? You talked about you haven't been in the building that long, but yeah. how do people, uh, I know that people coming through the court system, you find them, but for other individuals that may need assistance in whatever capacity they're looking for uh, help, how do, how do people find out what you do and that you are open 24 seven? So we, um, you know, Obviously our partners like Kathy Gurley with You Have the Power, they refer to us. So that's that's one big source. We have a lot of um, social media campaigns with videos that we have created um, to let people know that they can come to the Family Safety Center. Our website has all of those videos. They're, they're really good videos. I hope folks will take time to go to, you know, our Nashville.gov website for Office Family Safety for that. Um, we get a certain amount of funds in our budget every year um, to, to work on our outreach and target population. So we have one person who's a native Spanish speaker who works out in the community and provides um, advocacy and order protection assistance out in the community um, that needs her the most. Um, could we use more people that can go um, into the community and work that way? Yes. Um, could we use some more remote um, equipment so people can maybe go to, let's say, their community center, their library, and be able to remotely access the service of our Family Safety Center? Yes. So since COVID, you don't actually have to come in. Um, we can work with you remotely um, as long as you know you have Wi-Fi and a pretty good system and you can get on Zoom. We can work yeah. with you and do all of those things in that way without you even coming into the building. Do you see, um, particularly as you stay in the building longer, more and more people figuring out where you are and what you do and then them coming and utilizing the services? 
Yeah, it's, it's, it was a little hard to assess with COVID, but in terms of our client visits from our first year being open to 2020, um, our number of client visits went up 72%. Part of that was people coming more times. That's that I talked about earlier. We saw a more severe abuse in 2020 and clients coming back for more and more services multiple times. The number of actual individual clients went up by almost 30%. Okay. Interesting. Um, all right. So before we leave, uh, this has been really, really helpful, helpful to me. And I think helpful to everybody else. Um, I'm so impressed that we have this in Nashville. Oh, I, um, I, I knew, I knew parts of it, but I didn't know all of it. I love um, uh, what y'all have done in terms of the space and accommodating people and particularly in the courthouse. I think that's such a smart idea. Um, and um really proud of the fact that, and your work and the and your staff's work that's really really important um for so i know we we gave out the phone numbers uh for uh elder abuse child abuse i think uh domestic violence um the number to call for you all what's the what's the number and what's the website for you guys well, it's, it's just go on to nashville.gov and type in Office Family Safety would be the simplest way to remember it. Okay. So to call, call our Family Safety Center is 615-880-1100. And um, again- you may, want to, you may want to repeat that again. Okay, 615-880-1100. And again, okay. you don't need an appointment to come in at all. We actually, you know, unless you're seeing a therapist in the police department, we don't really do appointments. So um, okay. just come on in. So this is uh, uh, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Yes, yes it and is. And you, you all had your <laughs> Meet at the Bridge program last week uh, or last Saturday. So yes. um, just um, as we conclude, tell people what that was and what that does. So the Meet Us at the Bridge is done by the nonprofit Nashville Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And it is a homicide memorial and an award ceremony, which which sound like really weird things to put together, but we do acknowledge the number of homicides that we've had over the past year, which in 2021 was 15 hom um, domestic violence homicides, which is 13% of the total homicides um, for our community. <clears throat> I just wanna say 63% of those homicides were committed with a firearm, which is a 22% increase. So that's a really important thing for us to be keeping our eye on. So we talked about that at the bridge ceremony. Survivors come, um, they talk about the one that was killed and their family, and then they release um, a rose or roses into the river in loving memory of their family member. And then on the other side of that, we acknowledge and, uh, and provide certain awards for practitioners in the field. Because you know, we know the exact number of people that were killed each year, but we don't know how many people's um, lives were led to safety because of the work of the people that were called to work in the area of domestic violence. And so that is part of that ceremony as well. And it happens every year in October. All right. It's a very, um, it's a very <coughs> important ceremony, a very moving ceremony. And um, so uh, every year, October is the month, and that's when the program is held. Diane, thank you for being our guest today. Thanks for all the information. Thanks for what you and your staff do for the city of Nashville and Davidson County. Um, we really appreciate your time this morning. Um, we will be on next week. Uh, we are working on a guest for next week as we speak, um, but we'll be on next week. Um, the sun is out. It looks like a beautiful day. I think it'll warm up a little bit more. Um, so everybody be safe. Diane, again, thank you for being our guest. Vice Mayor. Vice Mayor, thank you so much for having me. I've been wanting to ask to be able to come on. So I was really excited when I got the invitation. So thank you. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you uh, I'm glad we finally got to you and, and thank you for the information. Everybody you. have a nice thank week. You, everyone. Everybody be safe. Thanks. <laughs>